Lesson 16. 16th lesson. There is this guy who I sh** not walked in, uh, walked right next to me and started urinating, like, right next to me at the same bush in sa- at Golden Gate Park, which, for those of you who don't live in San Francisco, is the largest park in San Francisco. Was he from the same bar? I don't... I don't know. He was pretty drunk. Uh, I asked him, hey, how's your night going? So, you know, I'm pretty drunk. It's like, I'm going, um, uh, going to the bitter end on Gary. I was like, that's a pretty, that's a, that's a trip. <laughs> it's, it's like quite a lock. He thought he was on the other side of the park. Yeah. <laughs> and then he left. <laughs> And then I remember before he left, I said, Godspeed, Spider-Man. <laughs> and he turned around and started laughing. He was like, ah, <laughs> Spider-Man. I was like, yeah, <laughs> Spider-Man. And that was, my, that was the last night I went drinking. I'm not saying, like, last night forever, but I'm saying, like, the most recent time I went drinking. Anyway, let's get this review on. <laughs> A review of uh, Sweet Home. Now this is a uh, this is a James pick. I don't. I didn't think you guys took me seriously when I recommended a movie. Now I feel bad because I fell asleep through like a good fifteen minutes through the film. Now. If you're, if it's your first time listening to us, thank you. Everything is going to be okay. My name's Tim. Uh, well, let's let's go in this order. What? Uh, who are you speaking right now? Uh, Willem Dafoe from the hit series uh, Spider Man and Spider Man Two and Spider Man Three. I don't think Willem Dafoe popped up in Spider Man. He's always know. in flashbacks. Harry's always going crazy. In Spider-Man 2 and in Spider-Man 3, Harry goes crazy and sees Willem Dafoe. And in Freaks and Geeks. Can't forget about Willem Dafoe's cameo in Freaks and Geeks. That's right. Who did he play? Wait a minute. <laughs> His when? evil father. He was the Green Goblin. James Franco's oh, evil dad. <laughs> I got there. And uh, first time on this podcast. Hi. <laughs> Hanako, just Hanako. Yeah, just Hanako. <laughs> the this... H is capital. Yes. <laughs> and of course, I'm a very special guest. Uh, Shang, aka Topher Grace, to- aka Venom, aka yes. <laughs> aka Eric Foreman, Eric Foreman, aka Eric Foreplay. AKA... Yes. <laughs> All of that. I don't know what else he's been in. Aka the guy who works at the pizza shop near my job. Yes. <laughs> I don't follow. What are you talking about? No, I'm just trying to joke saying that Topher Grace no longer has oh, yeah. a career. Oh, yeah. Well, we did just see him in a Black Mirror. Black Mirror. We were just talking about Topher Grace and yeah. how he has, like, a Star Wars mega mix. He, like, edited the first three oh, Star God. Wars movies to make it one five-hour Star Wars <laughs> oh, film. Jesus. He's got a lot of time on his hands. <laughs> yeah, there's no more um, uh, that 70s show money coming in. <laughs> it's like his FAQ. Topher, when did you find the time to take on this project? Well, it's been a lean couple of years for old Topher Grace. It's like that video where it's like TV shows that ruined Looper. celebrities. Or top careers. ten, yeah. Top ten celebrities. They can't play anybody else. Everybody yeah. remembers. Topher Grace one. ruined his own career when he left that Sony show <laughs> to like pursue his movie career. Mm-hmm. So the movie Sweet Home, nineteen eighty nine, picked uh, pretty much exclusively for its ties to the Resident Evil series. Oh yeah, that is the sole reason why I picked this movie. <laughs> Is because Capcom originally made the Sweet Home video game, and then they were going to reboot it, but uh, they lost the licensing, and so they made Resident Evil instead. And it was the same guy, uh, 
I've got his Japanese name here, but he's uh, known as Professor F. His name is uh, Fujiwara or something. Who, the director? Yeah, okay. the director of I Sweet Home. The creator of uh, the game. Was no, no, like... yeah. The creator of the game Sweet Home and the lead uh, producer or something on Resident Evil, but not... Uh... I thought that was Shinji Mikami. He is the director on Resident oh, Evil, yeah. but Professor F was still present during the game's development because, you know, they were going to do Sweet Home. Oh, they made Shinji Mikami the uh, director because he specifically... Like, he said in uh, interviews, apparently, how much he doesn't like horror because he's easily afraid. And so I guess the rest of Copcom was like, hey, direct this game. Like, uh... Mean. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he also was apparently afraid of this uh, Japanese game designer. I got a quote here about how he finds Professor F very intimidating. In a 2001 interview, he was quoted as saying, uh, Tokuro Fujiwara is a scary master for me. Maybe evil master. I still can't compete with him. I put myself at his feet. He is not big or macho, and he doesn't raise his voice either, but he is really scary. I think he's probably scared of everyone, you know. But as for the film, the film that spawned a NES game that spawned a franchise. Sweet Home is about a... A uh, Motley Crew, a uh, documentary film team, going going to a an old dead abandoned house, belonging to a dead artist, so that they can capture his uh, his old frescoes, should they oh. still exist. Now, what they find is uh, his wife's ghost, having passed away, uh, haunted by the you know accidental killing her uh, accidental. Um, what do you call it when you burn someone alive? Incineration. I was going to say uh, involuntary manslaughter. <laughs> <laughs> it can be both. So she incinerated their uh, their toddler, their son. Um, Accident. Oh, Air yes. quotes on accidentally. He had wandered into the furnace, okay? And uh, she turned it on, as she you was, will. Yeah, she was drunk, and she was like, You know what? I always wanted a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and the film crew stumbles into her uh, her uh, spirit. They disturb it. Someone kicks over the the pile of stones that's been keeping her dormant, and we still don't know who. But uh, you would think there would be some sort of a sign. Yeah, some saying, sort of wayfinding. Hey, or yeah, keep her stones like not on ground level. Maybe keep her stones <laughs> on, like, a hedge, or, like, a little, uh, or make it, maybe make a, um, like, a gazebo, and put the stones in the center. See, so it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how respectful it is to just have your memorial be a random pile of stones somewhere in the middle of the woods. No, you know, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that man did not do justice to his dead, murderous wife. <laughs> Nothing said, says memory. Nothing says memory like an unmarked pile of rocks. I still think it was too good for her. But <laughs> beat by beat, just to get everybody on the same page, they get permission to enter the house from I don't know who, a bunch of city council people. The house is clearly unsafe. There's beams and shit. Ah! Mission's falling. also in air quotes, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some guy had the key and just said, go, take it. Uh, they find the fresco that's like a Bach, Bosch painting, Hieronymus Bosch, with a baby on fire, like the Brian Eno song, yes. Um, For all you Brian Eno fans out there. <laughs> uh, the, the cameraman is mysteriously bathing their uh, lead uh, actress, the, the woman who's sort of uh, on camera doing this documentary, um, she gets possessed by the spirit of that evil, that evil woman, that nasty woman who uh, killed the baby and digs up, like while possessed, she digs up the baby coffin. Which, by the way, did anyone else here think that possessed news reporter was going to be like the main antagonist of the film? Or was that just me? It seemed like it. That's what they were leading to. I thought that she was gonna go on a killing spree, and I thought, "All right," but then 
She gets unpossessed, right. and there's like 15 more minutes of exposition before anyone else dies. And I'm like, that, okay, that is something I did have a problem with this uh, film, is that there's f- fucking 40 minutes of nothing. Um, and, you know, I don't, I'm not saying that I have a problem with character development or plot building, but it's just, they're in this home. A sweet home. A sweet home, if you will. (laughs) And, um, and they're just going on about the artist and they do some recording and that's fine, but then there's this weird side plot that goes nowhere about the uh, the little girl's dad. So she's trying to like get him to get his what? on with somebody. He's a widower, and she's just trying and to. She's you a wingman, apparently. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and so that goes nowhere. Oh god, I wish I had notes written. Um, and then um, what else happens? Uh. <laughs> like, well, so that's when all the supernatural stuff starts. They dig up the dead baby, and now uh, I kind of got lost in the shuffle. But that must get buried again because they have to dig it up again later in the movie. Yeah, because like, okay, they. What happens next? I mean, the the really the first bit of action is the cameraman, Mister Tracksuit, is uh, killed by a shadow. He seems to uh, melt in the middle, leaving yeah. only his ankles and his upper half. That's something else that I had a problem with. Like, two of the people get killed by shadows. Like, why? When you have the budget to get this fucking awesome looking animatronic slash claymated slash just like, um... Monster set piece. Yeah, like this, this, oh, this really cool looking monster that you don't show until like the last ten minutes of the film. I see what you're saying. The monster didn't even kill anybody. And it really only had two expressions. It waved its arms, and it could uh, sort of animate between an, uh, a, a sort of ooh face with its lips and an angry face. Yeah, but one thing I really did like about this movie is that, like, the effects, the practical effects are pretty good. Um, like, Mr. Tracksuit Man gets cut in half. And on the note, uh, special effects are done by, I want to say, Dick Smith, who was uh, the practical effects Dick artist. Dick Smith. That's his name. That does not sound like a real name to me. Well, it is. He, uh, well, you know, maybe uh, he had to change it for SAG. I don't know. But uh, he uh, was the practical effects artist for The Exorcist. Oh. Dick Smith. Was he, was he the one killed in Russia? No, 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 no. That was the practical effects artist for The Omen. We'll talk about that in another episode. Hmm. Um... But, uh, yeah, the practical effects are pretty fun for, like, the two deaths in the movie. Um, so, Tracksuit gets cut in half by Shadows, and, um, the somehow unpossessed TV reporter decides to just, like, flee the scene. Yeah, he starts chasing her. So that's, uh, that's probably the one connection I can think to Resident Evil, is we've got a corpse that's, like, crawling, uh, without legs, I mean, a torso, crawling towards her. He's the one zombie in this movie. Chasing is also in air quotes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And then, um, her death is my favorite, because it's, they get full-on Final Destination with it. Completely accidental death, because, like, so there's one part in the movie um, where you think it's building up to, like, um, like the killer's just going to be, like, some axe murderer. Because it's, like, a POV with someone holding an axe. Coming at you through the doorway. Yeah. Circa Michael Myers Halloween 2. Um, and... It's the cameraman. And it's the cameraman. It's Funny. a goofy moment. Yeah. Ooh, 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 and then ooh, ooh, the goofier moment about it is that they're just like, put that <laughs> thing away. You're going to kill somebody. And he's like, all right, all right, I'll put it away. Jeez, go off my ass. And he props it up in the uh, on the corner of this room, which I thought was the end of it. I thought that that axe was just gone. And then I was wrong. They brought the axe back. With the TV reporter, like, backing up into the wall and tripping. First she lands in a wheelchair. Oh, yeah. It rolls. 
bumps the wall, bumps the axe, which slides down the wall and hits her in the head. Yeah. And that it was by far one of my favorite movie deaths. That's like, I, I don't know what could top that. Because here I am thinking she's going to be the main antagonist. You know, she might she might live at the end. She might die. Who cares? She's going to be possessed for the whole film. Um, and then, lo and behold, she gets killed. She's the second person to get killed, not possessed. And does she even get killed by the demon? No. She gets killed because she bumps into an axe, <laughs> and then the axe fell on her. And I couldn't ask for anything else in the, from this movie. We could have turned that movie off and started this review. <laughs> on that note, the total whiplash in this movie, I guess it's not really from scene to scene, but uh, what we're talking about is directly followed by, like, Happy daylight driving scene. Doom, boop, ba, doom, yeah. doom, doom, boop, ba, doom, doom, With some like really bubblegummy like. Um, <laughs> You're not on a lav mic, by the way. <laughs> really bubblegummy, oingo boingo esque pop. <laughs> <laughs> Which I liked for like the first ten minutes. Yeah, the first act of this movie. It doesn't have any ominous music. It's sort of like N64 music, like like uh, Zelda Ocarina of Time. The first third of this movie does not take place in the house. <laughs> 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 the first third is them trying to get to this house, and then and then they're like in the courtyard of the house, and then they get into the house. And then you're like, all right, well, then I guess the killing's going to start. Nope. (laughs) So one of the major characters in this movie is the gas station attendant, played by producer... Stephen King himself. Yep. (laughs) Producer, I think, Juzo, Juzo Itami? Yeah. And that's part of the whole backstory of this thing. Uh, Itami and Kurosawa, not the Kurosawa, but a Kurosawa, the director... Worked together on this film, and uh, he was his assistant for the years leading up to this. Now, the film was released theatrically with uh, without, I think, alteration by Itami. But apparently all subsequent releases were tightly edited, uh, recut by Itami, maybe new shots. I don't know. But uh, I don't think Kurosawa was ever pleased with that. And it's just so interesting how big of a role Itami plays. Like, I would personally love to think that he just put his main, like, his, like, spiritual leader, gas station attendant character, uh, that he gave him all this exposition, like, after it had the theatrical release. He probably used literally all the creative control he had of the movie to put himself into the movie. And his wife. His wife plays the diva who gets axed. Mm Mm-hmm. Again, James's top ten kills in a movie. I don't know what that place is, but it places. Hmm. The uh, gas station attendant who uh, warns them that the ho- that that house be haunted, and then comes back to deliver basically every bit of exposition you could ask for. He tells them that it's the ghost because you knocked over the rocks. Uh, the ghost, uh, you know, uh, killed her own child, and then she started killing other uh, children in the village so that he could have company. And then the villagers turned and killed her. And now you done disturbed her. That's basically every. You get all of that in one scene. He's like <laughs> Japanese version of the farmer from Pet Cemetery. <laughs> Sometimes dead is better. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't even know who that actor is, but he's like the monster's dad. Ah. Now the daughter, I don't think we've mentioned Emmy. So the main cast is the widower, Mr. Lonely Dad, and his daughter, Emmy, the precocious uh, girl trying to set him up with um, the woman whose name I forget. uh, Akiko. So Akiko is the... the like lovely image of uh, of uh, motherhood, even though she's single, and uh, she uh, she, the dad, and the gas station attendant are the only ones left to save Emmy, who's been kidnapped by shadows or something. And this is probably the weirdest scene in the movie 
the gas station attendant trying to explain that you have to use the concentration of your mind. He sings a song and swings around a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> Just to get himself psyched up. Yeah, I was trying to look at what uh, he was drinking because it was in English. Hmm. Um, it was some sort of cheap rum. Um, maybe Georgie's. Hmm. Anyway, he gets himself psyched up, opens up a trapdoor that's glowing green once you open it, and they go down to rescue Emmy. Uh, long story short, he gets Emmy back, but dies in the process. He melts into a skeleton. Circa uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Exactly. Um, was it Raiders of the Lost Ark? What oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I get my Indiana Jones flicks confused. I haven't seen a single one in a really long time. Hmm. He's dead. As they are leaving the house, it's just sort of a deus ex machina. Emmy f- crossfades into the demon woman again, so they have to go back and save her. Um, the dad tries to go back in the house. We just lose touch with him. And it's left to Akiko, who, who uh, based on what the old man said, that a, a single mother can't hope to defeat, you know, the power of, uh, of a mother who's lost her child. And uh, so she dresses up in the dress that uh, Emmy's uh, biological mother wore. And he's dead mother, and so it's he. She's using you know dead mother magic against dead mother magic to go back into the house, back into the furnace to save Emmy, and the whole movie has its climax with the giant animatronic puppet of the evil mother of the house, who Emmy s- satiates by giving her her dead baby back. So wait, so the mother's plot is that she was a mother out for revenge. So she started killing kids around in the town. Not so much revenge. She just wanted her dead child to have other dead children to play with. Okay, well, she gets fixated off of killing kids, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, and it has, uh, and her backstory revolves a lot around a furnace. And she gets killed by the parents of these kids. And I'm here thinking, if she had worn, like, a uh, Christmas sweater or, like, a top hat and, like, uh, <laughs> she would ju- oh, she would just be Japanese Freddy Krueger. Or, like, at least have, like, like, not the finger knives, but a knife or something. And as she's, like, dying in her own furnace, she says, I'll get you in your dreams, yeah. where your children, you can't protect them. <laughs> she goes, uh, so I was like, oh my god. And she goes, no, this is God. <laughs> I think Robert Ingold should have played the mom of in Sweet Home. Could have happened, you know. They had the money for the uh, the exorcist yeah. guy. They should have spent not. They shouldn't have spent uh, that money on the exorcist guy. It's brought over Robert <laughs> Engel. <laughs> Put a wig on him. <laughs> Call it a day. He could keep that uh, that like goatee that he rocks mm-hmm. when he's not Freddy Krueger. Hmm. That was some crazy animatronics there. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, it got fun. I at the very end. Yeah, that. You think that it was on rental or something? Like, maybe they just have to, like, yeah. put it away. Or it's the last thing they built. And they're like, okay, let's shoot the ending. <laughs> or maybe um, they had supposed- other scenes shot or tried to shoot other scenes, but uh, the animatronics weren't working. And mm. It's as planned. <laughs> <laughs> we got to change the ending. Something where the, way the, the suit just has to look angry and then look sad. That's another thing. <laughs> the suit... It looked fine. I like the shots more when it was clearly like a person in makeup. Hmm. But the that person in makeup, it looked pretty what? cool. I feel like they could have used that as the antagonist and not shadows. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's like uh, they only show extreme close-ups. Usually when they're possessed or when she's about to strike, you get that one shot of the gruesome, you know, female yeah. ghost. The practical effects for this movie, though, are cool. The axe of the head, the guy cut in half, and then um, the Raiders of the Lost Ark guy. 
All fine. Um, I think it is interesting reading all about Kurosawa. He uh, was described uh, by someone on Midnight Eye, which apparently is a pretty big uh, Japanese cinema site in English, that uh, about 2003, this will be after Pulse, which might be the J-horror movie he's uh, most well known for. Uh, He was described as possibly being the most respected filmmaker in Japan at that moment in time, which, you know, humble beginnings. I think Sweet Home is probably the last movie he'd want to be remembered for. But Pulse is sort of more in the realm of uh, The Ring. Mm. Oh, fun. (laughs) What is uh, the... I don't remember what the Japanese name for The Ring is. Just Ringu. Ringu. Yeah. I still need to see Ringu. And the Japanese, uh, like, I want to watch the original The Grudge, original Ring. I do remember watching the original One Missed Call. However... I did not... I was, like, 11 when I watched that movie. So I did not watch it with subtitles, which was my fault. I should have... I watched a a dubbed version. Oh, wow! Which was not the smartest idea. But I'll tell you what. Dubbed One Miss Call a thousand times better than the American remake. (laughs) I remember Ugh. the poster for One Missed Call, which is uh, eyes replaced with mouth, like basically her face. The Japanese one? No, no, the poster for, I think, the American oh, One yeah. Missed Call. The, probably the one thing that's interesting about it, it's got screaming face, but her eyes are replaced with her screaming face, and the eyes on those little screaming faces are replaced with her screaming face. That sounds fun. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's a good poster. Yeah, it doesn't really have much to do with the plot, <laughs> but that's Okay. Um, we don't need posters that have anything to do with the plot. Like, uh, the poster for Scream is, like, Drew Barrymore just, like, <laughs> bam! Big face, and she's, like, in the movie for five minutes. Uh-huh. <laughs> this isn't funny! <laughs> I don't know anything for quotes. <laughs> My boyfriend's on his way and he's gonna kick your ass! <laughs> <laughs> Turn on the lights! He goes, you hang up on me again, you little bitch, and I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> Something like that. Did I tell you who voiced Ghostface? I think I know who voiced Ghostface. Mojo Jojo. Yes. Ooh. What a fun little fact. Ghostface and Mojo Jojo. <laughs> here's here's humble beginnings. I love I love this. So uh, his official theatrical debut was a Pinku Ega. A softcore pornographic film, which is a big industry over there. <laughs> it's just <laughs> like Wes Craven's Beginnings. Mm-hmm. Well, it was his second film. So his first real film in theaters, uh, this is director Kurosawa, uh, and you would, you would hope Akira Kurosawa has such a, such a uh, origin story, but uh, Kiyoshi Kurosawa's first film is Kandagawa Pervert Wars. And now, I look this, this was up. Was that a softcore? Oh, yes. This is a softcore. This Herbert is Herbert Wars. Greg Ferguson, who has only written this particular entry for IMDb, this is a user submission, one would imagine, summarizes the plot. Two sexually energized young women who live in a high-rise apartment building happen one day to spy from their window a mother and son making love in the apartment across from theirs. They decide to stage a rescue attempt to free him, and in the process, one of the young women ends up falling in love with the son, despite having a boyfriend and enjoying sex with her female companion. Of course, the mother they are warring against has her own plans when she feels her privacy invaded. Wow. That sounds fun. Add it to the list, I guess. Oh, right. (laughs) I don't know if we'll get a strike from YouTube. (laughs) Now, it says here that, that, like, it has references to Alfred Hitchcock's rear window, inventive directorial devices... Playful mannerisms and in-joke allusions to Kurosawa's favorite Western films. I think if anybody looks this thing up, they'll, they'll tell that I'm sourcing all this from Wikipedia. But uh, the studio was less than delighted with the result, and they shelved his second pink film uh, effort as not sexy enough. But he, was ma- he managed to save the pieces, uh, the non-erotic pieces, and release basically his first real movie called The, like, the Roar of the Do-Re-Mi-Fa Girl. That's his second movie, the third, Sweet Home. And I just thought this was interesting. 
worldwide English title for the Do Re Mi Fa girl, Bumpkin Soup. Bumpkin Soup. It takes. She's a city girl, and she goes to the countryside. It's not a pink film. It's not a pink okay. film, but it's made with pieces of a pink film, oh, and pink film. Oh. that's softcore. <laughs> right. Oh. And oh. Itami acts in that one as well. So uh, Itami's last acting credits are for Bumpkin Soup and Sweet Home. Is Bumpkin Soup also softcore? Or? No, it's just from <laughs> pieces of a scrap softcore movie. Pay attention. Clearly we're obsessed with you, pink you films. Are, you're breezing through these notes. We gotta... Um, yeah, I'm still stuck on the rear view mirror reference. Uh, they watch another apartment through their apartment windows, and they they can tell something's wrong. Just is like one in of them rear a window. wheelchair. Oh, I don't know. Hot. Yeah, we'll have to look that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just as hot as uh, that uh, iconic 2007 like reboot, Disturbia. Ah, except uh, Shia LaBeouf was. Um, under house arrest instead of being in a wheelchair. They're like, how do we make it 2007 enough? <laughs> anyway, he cut. He kind of uh, works on his craft in V cinema, like direct-to-video movies, just like genre movies, like detective stuff. I don't know if you're, if you watch like 90s. V cinema? Like, I don't Is know. Maybe that's an English. wasn't direct-to-video? Did no. they have like a theatrical release? Oh yes, that's why oh. I counted it as his first uh, film. Wow. Through the 90s until his first real success, the 97 movie Cure, which is, I think, when he starts to oh, go... Oh, I remember that one. Cairo oh or God. Cure? Cure. Yeah. That was an... I cannot watch it. Yeah. <laughs> really? Uh... It was a... Yeah, I'll tell you after the recording. But <laughs> no, 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 we can talk during the recording. <laughs> it's psychological, kind of... It's not really, like, a brutal in there, but kind of creepy, weird feeling, psychological thing mm. there a lot. And I was watching with my friend together, sitting right next to each other and just right after the movie ended I felt something in back and my friend said she felt the same time and I was like <laughs> <laughs> and they're standing and they're screaming what what's happened what's happening each other I feel something was in my back and I said same thing and wow. I felt like recalled by watching that oh. one it was so kind of weird kind of yeah movie and then it was a famous that time, but I felt, oh my god, it was it? Yeah. That's, um... It was a... Yeah. Hmm. They, uh, pay pe- they pay people to, you know, scare girls in theaters. No, um, <laughs> there was, um... There, there was this one movie I remember reading about, um... Uh... I th- I'm trying to look up, uh... I think the movie may have been called, uh... Tales of Terror. It's like a 60s movie. I bet I know what you're gonna say. But yeah, they put buzzers in the seats of the movie theater for like, uh, and there was like a little PSA that like kind of hinted to it at the beginning. Oh, but the guy's okay. just like, this movie may be so terrifying that you may get shocked throughout the film. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know, like, <laughs> damn. <Jesus. laughs> I wonder if that's the one, because I was thinking there was definitely a 60s movie where they would pay the theater people to, like, dangle a skeleton through the top of the theater. Oh, no, 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 no. This one is, they put, like, <laughs> buzzers in the seats, which I think is so <laughs> funny. Because, like, it's the 60s horror hasn't really been, like, the, developed as a strong genre yet. And, like, it's just, like, people probably freak the fuck yeah. out during it. These I'm, people don't know about 4D cinema. <laughs> 4D cinema. That reminds me of a, one I went to go see, Spike Hits 4D on Acid. But that's another story for another podcast. There was, like, a wave of 3D horror movies around that time, too, which I think is wild i didn't realize that 3d has been around since the 50s i mean i've uh i always um love that you know uh back to hitchcock dial m for murder was released in stereoscopic 3d and there was you know there were anaglyph um 
copies of the film, the old red and blue glasses. Yeah. But they had old, like a uh, new fashioned, I should say, stereoscopic 3D, just like we have. It was like, you know, probably less good than ours, but not all 3D movies back then were red and blue glasses. Some of them were just uh, like, you know, two projectors and you, you had uh, polarized glasses to... Yeah. yeah. I know, I need to um, get uh, a pair of those red and blue glasses because, like, uh, I have a, I have Friday the 13th 3 on DVD, which is in 3D. Nice. But it's 80s 3D. And, red uh, and blue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woof. I also, we gotta watch Jaws 3D one day here on the podcast. So is it Jaws 2, Jaws 3D, Jaws the Revenge? Yes. As long as I have that correct. Okay. And then Jaws Fire Island. Right. It's like a spin-off movie. <laughs> so this is Kurosawa musing on the nature of horror. Uh, he says that horror films are films that are scary. But is the story really so simple? He argues that things like giant monsters and serial killers aren't horror. The reason being, this scariness is something that can be conquered. Life will return to normal and people act under that, uh, that impression. There's scariness uh, for true horror movies, which is of a completely different type. For example, on the other side of the fence stands the darkened figure of a human being. When you look carefully, it looks like a friend who has died. You gasp in surprise. In the next instant, the figure disappears. So, how do you overcome this fear? To put it bluntly, there is no way of escaping this fear as long as you live. It is nonsense to argue over whether giant monsters or dead people are scarier. Obviously dead people. He wants to give the generic name horror films to this family of films that take as their subject the subject matter of fear that follows one throughout one's entire life. Would uh, would you say I think this film kind of uh, has its cake and eats it too? We get a giant monster and dead people. Barely. I mean, <laughs> we get one zombie for... Two minutes. Two really long minutes. <laughs> two minutes of uh, the TV host getting chased by a guy who's missing half of his body. It would be more interesting if it was his like trying to like chase her like uh, something out of like a Scooby Doo. Con- uh. <laughs> um, this felt a little like Scooby Doo. But yeah, he is just crawling towards her, and I thought. I didn't. I didn't register. Maybe this is the three hours of sleep. Um, but I didn't think he was a zombie. I was like, is he just bleeding out? Like, uh, just trying to get help from her? You know, that could be. <laughs> he wasn't exactly rotting. He, yeah. he he was just uh, you know, half a person. Yeah. Um, because he wasn't missing his legs. He was missing his like entire waist. Mm-hmm. That was. <laughs> Which, I'm no doctor. But I thought that uh, getting chopped in half is, like, a pretty instant death. You There's some, like, vital organs, like, uh, connecting your top and bottom half. <laughs> but uh, who am I to say? I'm just an audience member. He died with his lungs full of air. Yeah, and he crawled for... Like two uninterrupted minutes. <laughs> it felt way longer. <laughs> um, but his death was cool. It kind of dragged, and I feel like that's another re- the that's something else that like uh, this movie has. The deaths are kind of dragged out because it's like a cast of five people, which I get. I understand. I would much rather have a movie. That has five important characters, three or four of them die, meaningful deaths, than a movie with 20 characters, and then, like, 19 of them die, but you don't remember, like, most of their names. I'm looking at you, Friday the 13th. Um, <laughs> like, I, I do like having characters that are relatable who get killed off, because it provides more of a, like, um... It provides more, like, sympathy from the audience, you know? You get... Your world was based on them. It's just with this movie, like... I just didn't give a shit about the two characters that did die. Like, the TV reporter was an asshole, and the camera guy was just trying to... That was, like, their character arc. 
Okay. Now, uh, old old gas man Itami, he saved uh, the daughter. His death was more meaningful. That's true. I did feel something when he died. And now, if they had some real cojones, they would have killed off that dad, too. I don't remember exactly what you said, but it was along the lines of he goes back to the house to try to save her, and he uh, and he fails. And But we later find out at the end, he goes in. I don't know how long he looks for her before he finds some, like, shelter to hide in. And he just, like, hid out there for the rest of the movie. <laughs> it's, it's like it pans to this like cupboard at the end of the movie and he just pops out of it he's like alright <laughs> <It's like, laughs> the day is yeah, saved yeah, yeah. Uh, I knew if I hid from the monster she would give up <laughs> the whole climax of the movie is uh, it, well it's all women what if he thought he saved the day that would be <laughs> so funny <laughs> ladies <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, ladies. <laughs> the man saved the day. All I had to do was hide in a cupboard until she gave up. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You gotta give somebody one realistic hero to relate to in the audience. You know, the coward. That's all. <laughs> yeah. hide in the but cupboard. I did like our protagonist for as little scream time as she had. She got screen time towards the end, but during, like, the character developments, it was the the girl and her daughter, and the TV reporter, and the camera guy trying to find her, and she was just kind of lost in the shuffle. Every now and then, she'd show up to the daughter, and the daughter's like, hey, she's dead my dad. I'm single. <laughs> it's ready to mingle. She's like, uh, um, like, um, I don't, <laughs> I don't feel comfortable with, like, a... Well, I can't tell if she was 14 or 20. Year <laughs> 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 old girl to try to hook me up with her her father, whose dad just passed away. So, the giant animatronic puppet. Yes. It Which appears. I liked. Oh, it's a good puppet. <laughs> I thought it was fun. It reminded me a lot of the Evil Dead. Ah. Minus the oatmeal. <laughs> What's the oatmeal? Brains? The oatmeal was, um... Not brains, like, um... Pus. Bile and uh, pus that, like, uh... That, like, two of the characters... I remember the guy, I don't remember his name, um... The guy who's not Bruce Campbell. When he's dying, when he's bleeding out, he's like, starts, like, throwing out this, like, pus-bile combo that is just oatmeal. What a fun movie. We should watch that sometime. Yeah. Those uh, zoom-in shots, you know, it's just uh, Sam Raimi on his bicycle. Oh. I thought that was so cute. Yeah, yeah this like little 19-year-old kid oh. making his uh, multi-million dollar uh, Hollywood film. And uh, Brain Dead is Peter Jackson? Because yeah. I'm interested in that, too. I haven't seen Brain Dead. My only exposure to it is Peter Jackson being himself. I think he's hanging himself like it's a clone or something. I might be wrong. But okay, but I do remember the exact quote is, All right, what are you who is doing on my home planet? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that he's Australian. Like, yeah, or, or New, New Zealand. Zealand. Yeah. The same thing. <laughs> Come on, people. <laughs> That's like... Trying to differentiate people from Texas and people from Tennessee. <laughs> okay, so the puppet. It doesn't do much, but we do get a nice shot of uh, a bunch of baby heads growing out of its neck, of the out of the wall behind it. It's nice effects. <laughs> there's uh, there's Emmy. Think... Emmy's the only one who knows what to do. She opens up the coffin, offers the baby... And we get this look, drawn out moment of the animatronic holding its dead baby and a tear rolling down its cheek. I just gotta say, your hand motions, I don't know why I pictured uh, you, um, the lady when he said, open up the coffin. I just pictured her ripping one of the baby's heads <laughs> off of her shoulder. I was like, that didn't happen in the movie. I was like, I was like is that the director's cut? <laughs> Just rips it off, lowers it above her head. <laughs> throws it down, like spikes it like it's a football. You consistently uh, reminded us it was missing a lot of chances to be heavy metal. 
Uh, yeah. I wanted it to be... I don't know why I really wanted it to be, like, along the lines of Evil Dead 2. <laughs> and it just wasn't... Maybe it's because I've watched a fair share of Japanese horror movies, and those movies get pretty heavy metal. Um... But, uh, like, uh, like, we should watch Audition sometime. Mm. <laughs> Y'all hear that movie? I know a little bit. I don't know if it was, uh, oh, not Audition, but Ichi the Killer was a trailer at uh, the Roxy. Uh, I don't want to watch s- it either. I don't want to watch either. Audition's fun! It's about <laughs> these ladies getting revenge on this asshole guy. Wait a minute. I think that's Korean. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. It is a Korean movie. I'm just three hours of sleep, everybody. <laughs> well, uh, wrapping up the plot, the uh, the animatronic turns into a, uh, oh, a yeah. ghost because her redemption arc is complete. And biggest cop out of this film. Um, it's basically, the this like. Super heavy metal looking, something straight out of like a King Diamond music video monster, hell bent on revenge, gets her baby, and like, in my head, I'm like, it's gonna burst into flames, <laughs> it'll let off like a demonic screech, go, <laughs> and then like, get dragged into the depths of hell. What does she do? Turn into the f- Virgin Mary and flies <laughs> off into heaven. Turn to her home planet. To her home planet. It's like heaven all acts. is forgiven. <laughs> all and, the kids um, killed. And she gets off scot free. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, she's like, I'm just kidding. I killed your friends. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who worked at the gas oh. station. <laughs> it was just a prank, bro. <laughs> And on that note, Toho, release the Kurosawa cut. Let us put uh, King Diamond over it. <laughs> Top it with King Diamond. I'm sure he'll be okay with it. <laughs> That's all I got. I'm ready to wrap this one up. Well, I'm on the phone. I'm your Toe for Grace. Toe for Grace. You're Hanako. Hi. I'm just Tim. <laughs> That's a show. Bye. Bye.